president. Okay, let's call to order the Blue Ribbon Commission on the Metro budget uh, for February the 8th. It is uh, 11.09 uh, a.m. You all should have received copies of the minutes from last meeting. Those are now on the uh, website, uh, or will be very shortly. Um, I'd like to uh, like get, get approval of those minutes, please. I can have a motion. Move approval. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, the minutes are approved. Okay. Um, Margaret, I put on the agenda notice of appeal rights, um, mm -hmm. but I don't actually have the language for the notice of appeal rights. Um, so it is on the agenda. You don't think it's applicable? You're not taking any action today. No, and but most, but at one point it was required that all boards and commissions have the notice yeah, of appeal rights, regardless of whether it was applicable to actions before the okay. board. So just kind of a. I think if you just say it. that all actions taken today may be appealed to circuit or chancery court, you should consult your own legal counsel. That takes care of it. All right. All, all decisions made today are appealable to circuit or chancery court. You should seek your uh, own legal advice in making a decision as to wait, was, whether to do that. Um, great. Maybe you can give me a little blurb for uh, the future. Um, okay, so on to old business, and then we've got some good stuff. Uh, we're going to hear from uh, IT, and I've got some data and some survey results and some other things that uh, I want to share with you guys. So um, update on any department conversations that anybody wants to share at this this point? I mean, I have, uh, I've met with Renee Pratt at Social Services. I had a good conversation with her. She had a very well-prepared presentation that she gave me an extra copy that I should probably submit to you yeah. uh, for there. I also met with Mark Sturdivant at uh, Public Works uh, and his team. Uh, you know, they're very forthright, very interested in contributing to, to our process. Uh, a couple things. The, the results matter uh, process that was used in the past, both of both of them referred to that uh, as still guiding them in some of their work. So uh, as a lasting impression, um, at least not surprisingly to me, both departments are always looking for ways to be more efficient and more cost effective <coughs> and ready and have that pretty well baked into their planning and implementation processes in both departments. Uh, also kind of regularly track their performance metrics that they have. Um, so I, I, they've been, as I said, they were very accommodating and very open with me. And I've got tons of notes that I need to convert into some usable format. Yeah, because yeah, you're going to be asked to make a report. Everybody's going to be asked to make a report on your particular responsibilities, which we will then fold into the, the report that's due. So, um, Madam Chairman, uh, Jim Shulman couldn't be here. He asked me to fill in for him. Here are some, um, here's a sort of uh, working with uh, the council IT department, kind of a standard question here that people may be useful when they talk to the departments. And then there's no reason to distribute this out to everybody, but this is an example of kind of the matrix. Mm. That is I that the template that Jim that was talking about? That is the template, and uh, let me give you custody of the template. Okay, and then um, we what we will do is we will make the template available in, a, in an electronic form, because I think everybody would find that useful if that's and, okay. And in terms, I think, the feeling of having some consistency in the questions that here are eight questions that hopefully get asked by everybody at least. Um, which was just handed out. And again, okay. he apologizes for not being able to be Okay. Here. And those look like the eight questions we've been dealing it with. It is. Okay. So. I believe. Okay. Did you have any? I did. Oh, Brad, you we weren't finished. Was, uh, just I had followed up with Shannon Hall about communicating with Metro employees about ways to make uh, suggestions. And she's still willing to have something uh, that they can distribute. She just needs a little help, I guess, in getting the language that we want to share with uh, with that department, so there's a consistent message and some graphics. But what we have been using is the language that's on the website that talks about that describes the charge of the the commission, and and then just asking people, you know, how 
would you suggest to help us meet that car charge? I'll, and I'll send you that language if that will help. Um, so I, I had the uh, good fortune of, of meeting with Chief Anderson uh, and his staff, um, along with uh, Sheriff Paul. Um, very, very good conversations. They, they, uh, each staff was helpful. Um, I did address, um, since there was some, some media conversation about the, the raising of fines, um, and clearly they're, they're reluctant to do that, and I, and I kind of uh, certainly understand that. Uh, when you look at the uh, DOJ study um, with Ferguson, um, there was definitely um, uh, some communication about a 10% increase uh, in the amount of traffic tickets uh, that should be issued, uh, and so there was um, some issues as it related there. So uh, we began to, to talk in those areas about um, messaging, one, um, to make sure that um, we don't send the message that we want to punish um, the, the residents of this city. Um, and we began to look at creative ways to generate uh, revenue. Um, one of the interesting conversations that we also had was um, maybe shifting a little bit of cost burden and so uh, that, that was a very interesting conversation uh, that I had with him. Um, with, with Sheriff Hall. Uh, Did they have any specific suggestions on the, sh on the, on the, <laughs> okay. The, the, you, you, want, you want to save very, that for later? Very, yes, <laughs> they're, they're very specific, okay. uh, which, which I thought um, were, were outstanding. Okay. Um, same with uh, Sheriff Hall. Um, so very creative, um, and we were able to kind of talk about a lot of ideas, which you will kind of see in writing, mm -hmm. um, so that there will be some, some I, I'm assuming, some charter issues uh, that may be related to some of those ideas. Um, and uh, Sheriff Hall, I was very impressed with, with the metrics that they currently use mm -hmm. uh, and some of the um, outlooks that they have. So um, it, it is very exciting to be able to, to talk to them and, and look great. at areas. Um, uh, and I kind of understand, you know, it could be a little bit guarded, but, mm -hmm. but that's okay. Yeah. That's okay. Um, at the end of the day, um, we, we had a, a general conversation about, um, just to be specific about one, about the cost to um, the inmates when they are brought into the system um, with the uniforms or attire that they wear. Um, there is some reluctance to talk about uh, the fee that's placed on that. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things that I had to, to kind of bring Sheriff Hall along about was, was that if we're charging $15, and that's what we were charging 10 years ago, um, then obviously we, we don't want a cost burden on inmates but we also, too, can't operate uh, yeah. at a deficit. Yeah. And so those are things that we, we kind of need to look at, um, address. So there'll be some follow-up uh, between us as we look at hard numbers. Mm -hmm. And so um, it, it was, like I said, it was, it was very exciting to talk to them. Okay, that's great. Yeah, the, the I had a conversation with one of the council members about uh, court costs, court fees. Absolutely. And uh, I said, that's, that's really great, you know, to lower those and... You know, we don't we don't want to impoverish the impoverished. And I said, but got to look at the other side of the ledger too, which <laughs> is what it costs to run the courts. So you got to do both. If you're, Absolutely. If you're going to take that 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 route. So, any other? Gracie, Dave. We don't have anything this week, but mm -hmm. uh, we're making plans, hopefully, to um, attend a school board meeting before too long. Very nice. Hopefully. Tuesday. Yeah. Tuesday. Um, and. Um, Should be fun. Just kind of see where that goes. Okay. John? No update on my department. Okay. Um, so in my uh, in my bailiwick, um, I've got more general government, some of the uh, political offices. Um, uh, Nancy Whittemore, who runs general services, is going to be here um, next week. And um, she is going to talk about how... Uh, general services has in the past been able to drive efficiencies and avoid costs and um, and to give you a great example of that um, when uh, Nancy took over general services uh, in 01 I guess it was 02 uh, the per square foot building cost um, in Nashville for the three million square feet or so that we operate was around five and a half, six bucks a square foot. Um, she's been able to reduce that to three dollars. 
and that's real money that you know can be used for uh, salaries and and for um, uh, and for new projects and, and and other things that are higher priorities than an electric bill. That, you know, a building that leaks electricity or leaks uh, heat. Um, so, uh, so that she's going to talk a lot about that across uh, all areas of government, not just the buildings, facilities, but but also fleet and how maybe some of those processes that they've used can then be uh, uh, moved on to other areas of the government that perhaps hadn't had the advantage of of that kind of cost saving. Uh, approach uh, in the past, so um, so that's that was an important conversation. Law departments given me their um, their comments. I've got some follow up uh, questions uh, with them. Uh, planning is working on, and I'm just hitting the big ones here. Planning is working on um, on, on their questions. I'm really interested in some of the cost uh, co cost recovery that they've got going on because it's so uh, fee driven. Uh, the, the manual stand was great because it included all the ordinances that are associated with those things, and some of those ordinances are quite old. <laughs> so, uh, so that was very helpful, um, and uh, so I should have some more to report. So, again, we're gonna we're aiming for um, everybody to at least have their gonna general idea of what they're they're under their department. They're gonna suggest based on the field work, um, based on the comments that we got from the public, uh, anything you may have gotten uh, anonymously. Shooting for February the, the 15th there uh, in, in, in very draft form in your, own, in your own mind. And then I think we'll talk at the next meeting about how we want to then bring that, uh, bring that together and vet those, vet those ideas. Uh, on to... Um, Web survey results, uh, you should have received a spreadsheet from ITS that lists what looks like this, um, and it will be on the website, uh, copies there, um, if you want them. These are suggestions from the public, and I'd ask every um, member of the commission to review the, the list and pluck out the ones that are applicable to your uh, area of responsibility. It's that stack right there. Oh, I see it. Okay, I have it. Yeah, it's the last section. Okay. Okay. Um, so take a look at that. Uh, everybody was, <laughs> I was warned that um, we might get some salty language, but actually everybody's been quite, uh, 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 quite, uh, quite polite. Um, so that's, um, so please uh, review those as soon as you can. Um, any other submitted suggestions? I've gotten, as I mentioned last time, a couple of white envelopes at home, but um, which re mostly relate to police overtime and uh, pension costs. But um, but is there any other? Some anybody want to add any to the list? Well, yeah. I've gotten <coughs> uh, white envelopes in effect at home too on things. Um, one is kind of a generic um, contracting. Mm -hmm. questions mm -hmm. about blanket contracts and um, uh, blanket authorizations that are multi-year mm -hmm. and that um, how is <laughs> how is that checked up on so to speak would that be a procurement issue or question to go to procurement or I mean I think many finance and procurement I finance think. and procurement okay mm -hmm. But, uh, Depending on what it is. Uh, but again, it's the contracting aspect of it. Okay. That are they too open-ended and become um, a source of concern. Uh, famously, Collier's has been in the paper quite a bit okay. um, from this standpoint. And the concern by some citizens that that, that is being used in other contracts. Okay. And the degree that people... All seven contracts don't come back and go, well, what would it co cost the government to perform that service on an ongoing basis? Um, is that cost analysis ever provided? Um, but again, finance, back to the, resubmit that to the finance group, okay. I suppose. Okay, thank you. Okay. 
Any other comments on suggestions, thoughts? All right, well, I am going to turn it over. Uh, Keith Durbin apologizes to everybody because he uh, was planning on um, coming, but uh, but had had a, a conflict. So uh, instead, uh, Ed is going to join us. And um, the reason, and if you haven't figured out there's a theme here, there's a theme here, which is um, one of the things that <coughs> can really make a difference in how government operates and how much it costs to run that government is how efficiently, how data-driven, how evidence-driven it is. Um, and 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 we we have in the past been really good about that, um, not consistently, unfortunately. Uh, and, and I think the results uh, speak for them, speak for themselves there. So I've asked um, Ed to talk about how, what data sources we have, how we use it and how that can help drive decision-making across the, the government. So take it away, Ed. Thank and you And we'll be much. putting your, will you send a copy of your um, your uh, PowerPoint to the council office and they'll put it on the yes, website? Yes, I will do that. Yeah. Thank you, Emily, and um, thank you, everyone, uh, for the invitation this morning. Um, my name is Ed Geldenes, and I represent um, ITS, the Information Technology Services Division of Metro. And um, I was asked this morning just to talk about Metro data sources. And specifically this morning, I will touch on um, four specific programs that we have in, in Metro. One is Hub Nashville. Uh, then I'll talk about open data. Um, after that, Nash View. And I will touch on the Metro Resident Survey responses. Um, Hub Nashville, if you're on the page that says Hub Nashville, uh, just to give you some background. <laughs> Hub Nashville, uh, we started, we introduced Hub Nashville um, in Metro in July of 2017. Um, there was a need for uh, the community members to have a place where, a one-stop shop basically, where they can report um, issues and also request for services from, from various Metro departments and agencies. Um, the Hub National program was launched with the Central 311 Contact Center for non-emergency non risk um, reporting and, and uh, get uh, information from the various departments um, in Metro. Uh, we launched the program with the uh, 311 Contact Center, which is housed currently at Public Works in July of 2017. We did initially an integration with the Public Works City Works system. So that's all your streets, roads, and sidewalks, all the trash collection, um, everything related to the services that Public Works offers um, out of the City Works system. We did an integration with that system. We also um, had an integration with the council office, the mayor's office, and currently with the mayor's scheduling program. So that's all run through the Hub Nashville uh, software. Uh, we also launched Knowledge Base, where each one of the 58 um, departments and agencies have a knowledge base user who basically um, submit <coughs> knowledge articles to the Hub National Program. So they can publish um, knowledge articles, so in essence for the community members to be able to get information and for the contact center and other departments to have access to all the information that they need um, without sending the community members from phone call to phone call to phone call. So it's, it's, it's in their hands uh, with all the knowledge that they request. Um, in October 2017, we launched the community portal, um, Hub Nashville, where the community members, anyone can now register an account online, and you can go online from your home computer, from your tablet, you can uh, request services um, from the various departments and get more information as well. Uh, in April, we launched the mobile app for iOS and Android. Um, we also integrated the public records request system. So all public records requests is funneled through um, Hub Nashville as well. And then in September of last year, we integrated with the codes uh, CityWorks PLL system specifically on property violations. So that's now integrated with the program as well. If you page over, um, there's a number of, of screenshots that I put in here. It's just basically to take you um, on, a, on a journey through the workflow of what you can experience when you log into Hub Nashville. So as a community member, um, the, fr the first page shows you all the categories that we have. So we try to represent all the different departments so that 
if a citizen logs into Hub Nashville, they don't have to search anywhere else. They can get from there, they can get routed to the various departments that they need. Um, on the next page, I just focused on the streets, roads, and sidewalks. So we're representing in Hub Nashville basically all the categories that the various departments have in their systems, in their backend systems. Um, so you can see their potholes, damage sign, traffic light issue. And throughout the program, I want to um, state that as well, that um, there's, a, there's a search engine. So you can literally type in any word and it will take you straight to the request that you need, whether it's a knowledge article or if you need to submit a request to a department. On the page after that, it, it, sh it will show you all your related um, requests. So for instance, if you want to um, uh, submit a request for a pothole, once you start typing in the address and you choose the category pothole, on that map it will show you the dots where potholes have already been reported. So this helps people not to go all the way and um, and also do to go for the for the for the contact center people or people in the departments not to have to submit multiple requests and you know to prevent just, just that administrative burden so it shows you up front there's already something submitted you can go ahead and submit it again but it just shows you it's already there and this also serves for the internal departments they can see if something was already um, submitted at that specific location um, on the two slides after that it just shows you um, an aerial view a satellite view as well as the map um, to, to show you where the location is that you chose. Um, a lot of times you will type in an address and you will realize that the pothole is not really at this location and you can drag your, the, the marker basically to the point where that address is before you submit your request. One quick question. Yes, is there a mechanism if the potholes have been taken care of? Is there, will there be information on the website for them to know that? Yes, if, if a pothole hasn't been reported yet, it will show you here there's nothing at that location that's mm -hmm. been reported. But you can also um, you can also see the progress of the pothole of, of the actual request that you've submitted. Um, you know, I'll show you when you get to Nash View, the maps of Nash View, and so on. Uh, before you make a call, you can see if something is in progress or if it's already Great. dealt with, and so on. Great. Um, the screenshot after that one with the uh, with the photo attachment, it's just to, to show you some of the information. We've asked all the departments to please um, to give us everything that you request from the community member that submit a request. So if you say, I need the specific intersection's name, or um, I need to know what the poll number is with a, with an NES poll, for instance, uh, we add all those questions in, whether it's required and so on, just to make it more efficient for the people that deal with your request and also for you as the community member to give all the, all the information that you need to give them. You can upload attachments um, on your request as well. And then uh, it asks you for contact information. Now, as you can think with uh, some property violations, you can submit your request anonymously, but you can also create an account online where you can track all your requests from the various departments, where you can see when they add comments, you can see uh, basically from start to finish um, to have a track of all your requests. Um, until the end when it gives you a request number, and then, um, as I said, on the community portal, on the mobile app, or if you make a phone call, you now have a request number um, for your request. And as I said, you know, it helps with the transparency of, um, you know, to know what's going on with when you submit a request. The screenshot after the uh, request number is just to show you in the back end system at the call center. This is what the information is that they receive. So they have everything that they... It's like Salesforce. <laughs> it is Salesforce. <laughs> Salesforce. <laughs> That's great. That's brilliant, actually. <laughs> so they... Um, they have, it is a powerful tool and, you know, with the integration with the back-end systems, it just makes it much more easier uh, to get all the information and to get, get the, the, the issues dealt with as quick as possible. Um, the, the slide with the uh, graphs on, this is what's available to internal departments um, so that they can see what's open, what's closed. So basically any of the data that's in the database can be represented on dashboards, um, as you can see in that slide. After that, we also have a tool that, we go, that we're starting to um, put more work in, and that is um, predictive analysis. Um, 
this is still a work in process, but you'll see the slide that says public work top requests. Um, that will show you uh, year on year in 2018 how many of a specific request type that we had. So you can see what I've put in here was trash recycling, uh, cart services, mist trash, recycling, potholes, illegal dumping. So we can pull, pull any of the categories in the database and, and, and submit um, numbers on year on year, month on month, um, what are the trends that we're looking at um, in the system. Uh, we're looking on at working on a time to fix, so you'll see there's, there's, there will be numbers on how long does it take to, to fulfill a certain request like potholes and so on. Um, the slide with the green bars, that's just weekly trends. Just to show you again, you know, as we go through seasons like this week when we had the flooding and things like that, we can see, you know, what are the trends, where, where, where should resources be, be added to certain mm -hmm. places. Um, and then the last slide that shows the damage signs, this again is just a graph to show you how the departments are opening and closing their, um, their, their requests. It also gives you the lines to show you in which year what the average amount of, of requests for that specific request type was over the years. And um, in the software, in Salesforce, when you hover with your mouse over any of these graphs, it gives you more detail, um, as I said, to make more um, help with the decision making. Before I go to uh, national.gov, do you want to, me to take some questions now on Hub Nashville? Or? I have some. I've got several. I'm very excited to see it. I've been waiting 10 years. <laughs> um, but somebody, everybody else go first, because I might be redundant. Well, where does the prioritization take place? Is that, you know, if, if you get 50, you know, pothole requests on one day, you know, how are those prioritized? One thing that we're working with the program now is to put the, um, the to, 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 to gather information from the departments to see where there's SLAs that needs to put in place. There currently are priorities, um, uh, so there's, there's flags that, that will basically indicate if something's um, older longer than a certain time, and then if things has to be escalated, there are priority codes, which uh, basically, if a request is has to be dealt with immediately where there's an escalation and it can send um, a message in the form of an email currently and a flag in the system to the to the um, to the person on the other side that has to deal, deal with the problem each one of the departments that has the most volumes of, of requests that's coming into the city have a representative with a license to that work their cases we call it the queues so as a request comes in it's autom automatically putting put it into the departmental queue. Um, if a department, for instance, receives something, if public works receive a flooding request, for instance, it has to be sent to Metro Water or to Stormwater, they, they, they change the queue to Stormwater and they have the ability then to escalate the, the, the request with them. In terms of um, the, the, da the data that you're collecting here, how is that, like for example, um, how long it takes to fill, put in my request for the pothole, I can see the data on how long does it take to fill that pothole. Um, you're, you know that, right? Because right, yeah. once that service request is closed, it's closed yeah. yeah, then you have um, then you have the time, at, length of time it took to fill, Correct. To fill that pothole between complaint and, and resolution. Um, how is that data then, um, uh, I guess, gathered, uh, collated and then made available for decision making either at the department level or at the executive level um, and then of course I'm sure councils. Sure. That, is, that is um, on that slide where, where I showed the top request and year on year numbers mm -hmm. that's what we're working on now with the with the analysis tool is to to be able to accurately calculate the the, 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 the numbers and then these type of dashboards will be made available to Council members to heads of departments. Um, so currently, the um, the director of the 311 Connect Center they get on a weekly basis they get all these results. Um, but as I said, with the the timing and the SLAs and also the, um, the, the 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 time to fix, that's something that we're currently working on to get into the into the uh, reporting. Okay, and the. Um, uh the first thought, John, is I don't know that we need council members anymore. No, we probably don't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, and then, is there, are you now, are you planning 
you know, any predictive uh, algorithms where, you know, you can uh, third through the year, that whole pothole thing is looking like it's out of control. Right. What does the rest of the year look like That's in right. terms of, you know, what am I going to have to think about in terms of supplemental appropriations and so forth? Correct. That's not in place yet, but that's yeah. on the table for us to, to, um, to address is the prediction of what for instance, in the snow seasons, in the in the rainy seasons, what to predict in six months from now. We've got a very good, um, you know, during the first few months when we went live, there was a lot of, um, you know, uh, departments that wasn't 100% sure, so a request will come in, and when they transfer it to somebody else, the request will be closed, and so on. So there was a few things that had to be worked through since July when the when the departments were live. But in during 2018, we've got a solid 12 months of good data now that we can, um, you know, start working on the predictive analysis and the SLA. Okay, that was my next question. Is yeah, you know, what is your time series? How far back does your so, so currently we go back to July 2018, okay. uh, I'm sorry, 2017, okay. but we consider the year of 2018 as a good year with good data. Okay. Um, so, so now that we're in January 2019, we start comparing with year, with, over, with, year. With year over year. Yeah. Okay. Um, that is fantastic. Love that. Thank you. Any other questions? That's great information. Mm -hmm. It's really... Really great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, next, we go to data. Nashville. Did you have, I'm sorry, we had a question. I just wanted to say I use Hub Nashville a lot, and it is it's very user friendly. It's very nice, and it's it's very uh, I I find it very very uh, a good way to communicate problems. This is great for you. Thank you very much. It's very good. So, one really. question: Does it capture requests that don't come in through the website? Is that, is, is that what this represents? That all comes through um, Hub Nashville. So, so what, what you see there are requests that's captured through either the mobile app, uh, through the community portal, and through the contact center. And that comes in from other departments where they capture this in, into the system. For instance, with, um, with the codes uh, property violations department now, um, they just underwent training to capture all the property violations, to capture it into Hub Nashville, um, so that all the numbers that you see here are the numbers that's coming in. Is that, the part. So is it requires that short term rental complaints? Uh, there, there is an option for short term rental complaints. There's a request type for that as well. So that requires them to track it one place and then enter it into the system? Um, no, the, the, the integrations that we built with the city work systems with public works and code specifically um, feeds it directly into the system. So you don't have to, um, for instance, in the past with codes, they would take a phone call or an email and they have to enter it into a system. Now, if a community member, if you enter this into, into Hub Nashville, um, they basically just flag it to say yes, this is a valid, or it's a request. All the details are there, and it goes directly into CityWorks. So basically, it takes that that extra step from capturing into from one source to another source, takes that out of the equation as well. Can I ask a follow-up to Dave's question? I'm not sure if it was your question whether or not it, um, the the information flows go from the human beings who take the phone calls and their system and then kept flows into Hub mm. Nashville that way as well. The data is flowing both ways, so there's not multiple re-entry points. Correct, yes. And, and for instance, the contact center, whenever they receive um, the, the integration with the public work system, they just enter it into Hub Nashville. They don't have to re-enter it into, into so, a city work system. It flows directly into the system. earlier comment, somebody calls a council person and says, you know, there's a, you know, a, pothole um, at the corner of 5th and Main. Um, the council person takes it upon themselves to then call Public Works. But that's it gets entered at Public Works when that contact is made to Public Works into this system. Um, as opposed to, I guess you could go online, a council person could go online and enter it themselves if they that's right. were declared. And we, yeah, yeah, and there are, several, yeah. there are several council, council members that, that capture <laughs> that puts it directly into Hub Nashville. Good. Okay. That's good. Okay. Now, this, so, this, this, so this creates um, a lot of efficiencies. Mm -hmm. So instead of um, the my constituent calls me, I'm the council lady, they, they call me, they wait for me to call them back, we miss each other, two days go by, mm -hmm. um, I then call Public Works or I email Public Works. Um, and and then they put it into CityWorks, and CityWorks, then it 
then it's on its way. Um, how are we how are we capturing so that we can describe the efficiencies that are that are created? I, I would think speed speed of response would right. be a really good proxy for that. But right. uh, is there any any other ways to to articulate that? I, th I think the time of, of opening and when, when, as you said, you know, responding to the request is something that we will definitely be able to track. Okay. Um, I know the contact center um, also track with the Cisco phone system is integrated with the Salesforce system as well. So they have a lot of statistics that they um, track as well with time to resolution, time, to, uh, how many calls they take, um, you know, and, and what makes it more efficient as well for them is when when they take the phone call, the information of the, 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 the person that phones in is already displayed. So if, if somebody registered on, on Hub Nashville um, and they have requests, it's already they can already see the profile of that, that customer. Okay. This is just hypothetical. What if I really don't use the phone very much to call or what have you? And there are issues that I might have and um, how would I know that this service is available? Um, so currently with the community meetings, um, uh, we... Uh, uh, now everybody, all neighborhoods won't, won't have a community meeting every month right. or every week or whatever the case might be. How do you reach those people? Yeah. We currently uh, we currently try to. Uh, there's there's no real budget for marketing or um, you know um, advertising of Hub Nashville. So we depend currently on social media, um, and you know the mayor has sent out you know on his Facebook page a, a number of um, you know uh, just messages about Hub Nashville is available to the community. Um, <coughs> a number of the council members uh, post about Hub Nashville on their sites and as I said um, you know where there are community meetings uh, currently I know the mayor is talking about Hub Nashville um, out there on Nashville.gov we have you know where people were used to um, on the main page of Nashville.gov where they use customer service to get hold of any of the um, or to submit any requests to the departments we've replaced that with Hub Nashville so that way we try to um, you know get it out to the community currently we have magnets that that goes out during these meetings which people can have with uh, business cards on Hub Nashville but we are currently discussing ways of how we can um, you know use at or how we can market Hub Nashville um, you know without funding you know what's the easiest way to get the message out out cool. there but we know that yeah. what about flowers in the grocery store right. Yeah. Some place yeah. I want to libraries. Yeah, one of the things. Yeah. One, one of the things that we did at the end of last year, I think it was um, around about October, November. There were stuffers that was put into all the all the water bills that right. went out right. to right. Davidson yeah. County. Right. So um, I've got an interesting statistic on usage here. So in the in the resident survey, I've got a question in there that says, "Have you or anybody in your household used?" Hub Nashville in the last year, and so after only one year of this being deployed, and even limited, just two departments, um, an estimated one out of ten people in Davidson County That's has great. used Hub Nashville after only wonderful. a year. He's an example of wonderful. the the stuffers that was. Um, and what about reminders? Because sometimes you know, folks forget. You know, I can call this or or use those facilities. I think it's great. You and you mentioned two departments. I imagine the goal is all departments, right? But the goal is where we can have integrations with with department systems. Um, that is the goal to, okay. to to go forward. Yeah. Yeah, because one of the one of the it, it codes is codes runs probably and public works run now as thin as they probably ever have. Um, and so this is really a great way to deal with the, the really very tight budgets they've been on for quite some time. Planning is another, you know, place where they, they, they run on a razor's edge and the, um, and the public you know, gets a little frustrated by right, right. The, the, their ability to communicate um, because of that. So. Yeah. And, and in the future, you know, with the future of Nashville.gov, you know, with, with regards to gaining information about, um, you know, the, the various departments and the metropolitan government, um, that will be there. And then accessing services will be routed through um, Hub Nashville. But to the community members, we're planning to have that as a seamless. You don't know 
you don't really care if you log into App Nashville or if you're in Nashville.gov, you are directed quickly and effic efficiently to the, to the correct place to get services or information. That's great. The data is going to be super helpful for right. decision making. Let me ask you a quick question, and this, I apologize, this may be obvious if I had spent much time on the actual portal website, and so obviously I haven't, but in terms of the dashboards and reporting features, how much of that is internal city-facing versus public-facing? Um, we're looking at that now to see what are we going to put out to the, to the, to the public-facing so that, you know, some things like these dashboards and so on are available on, uh, you know, whether it's Nashville.gov or whatever platform we... We, we put that. So that is definitely um, something that we're putting out. But uh, that leads into, that's a good question, thank you for that. Um, that leads into open data because um, I, uh, some of you might be familiar with open data, but our open data program, uh, which you can access through um, uh, Nashville.gov if you just search on open data. Um, and, and just add that open data is a national correct. effort, and a federal effort as, as well. Correct, correct. So um, the, the slide after the menu of open data um, gives you just a, an example of the list of different uh, data sets that's out for the public uh, to access. So on the left-hand side, you will see like beer, uh, beer permit locations, building permit applications. Um, so when you click on that, you can access the data set. On your right is the metadata. You may want to define open data, just for anybody watching, just real quick. Uh, open data is, is any data that's that's uh, that's available to the public to access. Um, so any of the um, systems data that that's published on open data is accessible to the public to access. All of which would be available through a public records request right. anyway. Only you've saved yourself a step at the law department. Right, and, and when part of the idea here in this in open means in machine readable format. So mm -hmm. you know we're trying to get away from the days of posting these voluminous PDF documents that you know it's impossible to pull out what you need. So the idea here is to make it all machine readable and available online. Mm -hmm. Right. And then you're describing the metadata for each of these. In the, is that what's in those descriptions on the right-hand side? Yeah, on the right-hand side is the metadata, so there you can access the actual document to explain what the data, what the data components in this data set is. Mm -hmm. um, there's also a data, uh, open data uh, committee that approves the data sets and the metadata documents and so on. Uh, the next slide is um, a screenshot of when you access, I, for instance, um, went into Hub Nashville 311 data. So on a nightly basis, there's a feed that goes from the Hub Nashville system directly into open data. So on a daily basis, um, 24 hours, uh, uh, every 24 hours, there's a, um, an update on the data. So you can access any of the data that's available in, in Hub Nashville. Do we have all departments uh, participating in this now, or are we got any laggards? Um, no, all the, the departments that we've targeted during, as, as I said earlier, we take a phased approach right. to see, you know, the big volumes, for instance, public works and codes was right. the first big integrations that we had, and also get the council office and the mayor's office and the scheduling up. Um, so we are looking now at future departments, but uh, each of the departments have a representative, um, you know, with that has substantial volumes um, that can enter into Hub Nashville, or if they get requests in, um, it can be routed to those departments okay. but uh, but as we go through the phased approach we we we, um, we meet with those departments and everyone's aware of how Nashville we currently have a number of departments where they have a form that they use to send to somebody email somebody and say could you fill in this request in this form and fax it back to me or email back to me a lot of those departments have Who's um, got a fax machine <laughs> <laughs> but um, <laughs> Uh, for instance, last year we, we addressed some with, with FIRE um, and uh, we also meeting um, with other departments who said uh, we want to replace these forms that people have to fill in and bring it into us. So we put in all their requests in Hub Nashville so the community member can access it through their mobile phone or from a computer. Uh, the option to still come into the office and so on is still there, but this just gives them that option to, to do it um, on Hub Nashville. Okay, and then this data, is it currently um, being put in uh, reporting format for decision making and process improvement and so forth? Yeah, yeah the open data is, is available to to the various departments, you know, where they, where they, where they uh, 
need to use it for those those uses. But, but I think I think you're act, you're asking about a structured pr program. Um, they, there is no structured sort of metro wide program right now. Taking taking okay. this information and putting it into it's a sort of template for performance management. That's that's right now done on a department by department basis. On, on a voluntary basis, as they see right. as they see fit. Because because if I was sitting in the council today at budget time, I would be absolutely saying, okay, how many you know I, how many potholes did you fill last year? How long, how long did it take for you to you know get those filled? And mm -hmm. what what caused it to be longer this year than last right. year? And what do we need to do to fix that? Or you know, that, those those are the kinds of right. questions. Okay, well, it sounds like a recommendation to me. Yeah, <laughs> but it's good information. Uh, the next data set there is, this is uh, Brian's program that he manages, is the Metro Resident Survey. Um, and I put the screenshot in there just to show you this is also fed into open data, uh, which is made available to, to the public. Um, the next slide is Nash View. Um, Brian, did you want to add any background on the survey? And no, I don't. I don't. I mean, I don't need to say much about it. It's, it's um, so we, we kind of piloted it in 2018. Um, it's administered by a firm out of Kansas called ETC Institute that does does the same thing for for you know the majority of other large cities that do a resident survey. It's a random random sample household survey, and we've got it on a we do it uh, once a quarter, and um, we just uploaded the uh, fourth quarter 2018. Data and so we're gonna we're gonna do it at least two more quarters to get us through the end of this fiscal year and kind of take a look at it and see see how useful it's been. Okay. I'd be interested to see how it yeah affects decision making and resource allocation. Uh, the next um, source that I want to talk about is Nashview. Uh, Nashview is a is a fairly new program as well where. Um, any of the data sets that, that is made available um, can be populated on a map of Davidson County. So the first screenshot that you look at, um, it has the little red and green dots, but you'll see on the left-hand side on the legend, um, there's fire stations, police precincts, libraries, parks. So any metro buildings are basically, um, uh, can be, you can see where the locations are on this map. Um, and then on the next slide, what I've done you will see at the bottom left, you will see building permits, hub Nashville requests, property violations, and right-of-way permits. Those are four data sets that's currently pushed through to Nashville. So all that data that's already available is now populated on this map as you requested. What I did was I just picked hub Nashville requests. So you'll see around the city where you see the little numbers, the little circles with the numbers, and it means at that location or in that area, there's so many requests. So once you zoom into this map and you open it up, it expands and it gives you the request numbers and so on. Um, what I've done on the next slide is uh, just show you, you can pick the, so this is how everything is integrated with, um, with the categories that we started off with hub Nashville, um, you can choose the, the specific categories that you want to see represented on the map. Um, on the, the slide with the big circle with the little red dot in the center, what I've done is I took this address, our location here, and I said I want to see all the streets and roads requests that's currently in the city. And you can see it gives me a radius and then it populates all the requests there. Once I, once I hover my mouse or I click on one of these, it will populate the information. It doesn't give the resident's name or anything. It just tells me what the request is that's been filled in that specific location. Um, this is used a lot with, uh, with some of the meetings that's out in the communities and so on, because you can, you can choose your council district and you can present at a council meeting or at a, at a community meeting with, for your council members to see, okay, let's see how many potholes was open and how many were filled in our council district. So it's very good in representing um, the information in that specific council district. And then the very last slide is what we can do with this data as well is to uh, populate specific request types. So here we can see noise violations around the city, but we can also select it for a specific, um, just a specific region. Um, so Nashville is very powerful to give a visual representation of, of, of the data. You can also pick heat maps, so it can show you, you know, where are the hotspots around the city for specific requests. And as I said, this is not just um, um, 
uh, without Nashville, but any of the data sets that come in can be represented on, on Nashville. That's great. Any questions? Any questions? That's great. Okay. Thank you. I'm, Thank you. I have... It's not really a question, it's more of a statement I think I know the answer to, but looking at some of these like trends <coughs> and things like that, I don't suppose there's any current effort where you see multiple department heads in sort of a multi-functional um, team coming together to look at key trends that might <coughs> overlap in terms of their different departments to identify potential problem areas that you can almost in like the type of the Comstat type of That's a very good view yeah. I'm assuming the answer is no yeah, they, currently no, doing no, that. Not, not what I know of. <laughs> yeah, well I, I mean we have a the department heads have a long history of working together on, you know, projects and problems and, and working well together. But not in a structure. But not in the, within yeah. that within that that structure. Yeah. Any other questions? So, just to and again to bring it back to the the reason that Ed is here and the reason that Mark Swan was here and the reason that Nancy Whittemore is coming next week is is what what government sometimes does is not rely on evidence and data and and when it doesn't do that it ends up in what is known as slash and dash at budget time. Um, you're just like, I've got to balance the budget, and you haven't really been monitoring trends uh, along the way, and you haven't really been predicting where uh, things are going to end up because you're really doing it on anecdote, um, anecdote, personality, you know, those kinds of things. So, so bringing, you know, and, and focusing our efforts on trying to, bring the metro of government back to being really highly dependent on data and evidence and and information for decision making and particularly budget decision making and resource allocation is you know i think a core charge of of this of this committee um, I was there when 311 got assassinated, so I'm glad to see it's back. <laughs> it's like, no, don't do that. <laughs> so, thank you. Um, all right, well, if, Ed, thank you very much. Thank um, you very much for your time. Because I want to move on next to talk about um, major revenue sources. And I apologize for, uh, I did this again to y'all. I printed these things out in. No page numbers. I had, <laughs> no page numbers, and I did it in, um, I didn't do it on la in landscape yeah. form. And so I'm quite annoyed with myself, and I'm sorry about that. Um, ugh, ridiculous. But, um, so, but I'm, I'll walk you through this so we get it, you know, screw it up, keep your pages in, in, um, in order um, so we don't mess them up. But, okay, one, two, three. Uh, the clerical functions of this commission could definitely use a little help. Um, I'll help. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so may, the, the uh, last section of this handout uh, which is titled Major Revenue Sources, and I realize that there are two sets, but the longer set of major revenue sources. Um, I want you to pull that out if you could. And that is, has a CBD assessment, the Gulch CBD, local option sales tax, motor vehicles license. Those are the first entries on that one. Okay. Um, so what I did was I looked at the, um, and they and these stack like this, so they're pages like that. Um, so what I did is I looked at the major revenue sources in the revenue manual, and by which I meant really over a couple of million dollars a year, and I'd be hard pressed to make an argument that two million is a major revenue source in, in our budget, but, and I isolated, those um, those items that were really large revenue sources for uh, for the city. I excluded property taxes. We all know what property taxes are. are. Um, and what you will note is that there's about 600. Let's see for FY18 budget about 720 million dollars in in that accounts for the major uh, revenue sources. 
uh, including local option sales taxes is, is one. Um, another big one or federal pass through the business tax uh, and so forth. But if you go and you look at just ahead of that stack, major revenue sources, I took out anything that is subject to Metro law. In other words, it's here because Metro, the Metro code adopted either something enabled by the state or created their own permit or fee structure. Okay. Um, well, that number drops to $573 million, and that's keeping it in the water and sewer department. And by law, you can't actually move water and sewer revenues except through a payment through a tax type mechanism. Correct me if I'm wrong, Margaret, um, but you can't you can't you can't use you can't use the water and sewer uh, revenues for uh, general government purposes. Uh, they can pay for they can do pilot. I guess they could probably do other things around the margin. Well, it is we currently doing a pilot. We currently have a pilot. 3.2, which is directed to the stadium debt service, correct? Do you know when that's over? What? Uh, the, well, the stadium debt is over in about 2028. 20, I, I don't know when the exact, I don't know when the pilot is over, but it's, it corresponds with the debt. So. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't remember the extent. Uh, so the, so the, 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 the revenue sources available to Metro to increase, to, to get more revenue are somewhat limited by state law. Mm -hmm. It's just a fact. <laughs> um, that doesn't mean it's not, there isn't some flexibility as, as we, as we look towards solutions here. Um, but it, it definitely is something to, to keep in mind. There, there isn't a ton of revenue flexibility at the local level in this state. Um, and in actually most, most states are, are like that. We so if you, if you don't mind, I mean, Margaret's very valuable assistance. The pilots that are in here, the, the water pilot for the stadium funding on this list, I noticed the sports authority is paying a pilot. Fee. Yeah. Um, NES pays a pilot fee, and are those pilot fees under which category? I'm trying to figure out which list we're looking. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. Sorry. Major, 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 major revenue source. There's two. The big list or the, or the, or the, or the middle or the medium yeah. size? Uh, one says Metro. One says Metro. I'm sorry, which list? Oh. Well, I, I was just major. Uh, major. Four page or the six page? The, the, way I had it. I'm sorry. the major revenue with the CBID assessment as the first category. Well, they're both now, the water is two not in here, but we were just discussing it. But the Sports Authority pilot is in here, and I know that NES makes a pilot plan. All three are authorities. Well, these are revenue. Uh, these are these are revenue sources, not yeah. not. But so so in the case of the sports authority, that is, is the water pilot. That's the water pilot. That is that four million dollars. That's okay. the water pilot that's dedicated to the stadium. Okay. So that money is encumbered. So not three point two, but but four million. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, but that and that money is encumbered by the debt that the sports authority is obligated Pledged to pay. Right. Pledge. But but I know NES very kindly pays a pilot, which is pretty substantial. Is that in effect being lumped into property taxes? Because you've got the you've got the formal um, pledging of non-tax revenues of the general services district behind debt obligations of the city. Yeah. So it would seem like he, what what those revenues are and what the, and and by definition they're non tax. Right. Okay. So it seems like there maybe should be another category. Well um, the uh, you know, this is this is lifted just from the, the revenue manual, so right. not from. The well, budget. this this is an interesting wrinkle on that, and uh, again, for How do you mean? the revenue committee. Well, are we connecting, collecting? What are we projecting to collect from non-tax revenue sources? Where does it come from? Are there other non-tax revenue sources mm. um, that um, would enhance metro revenues? But again. Um, because by definition they're non-tax, I worry that sometimes they don't show up on these lists. 
Well, the um, point I was trying to make here is, a, you know, we read it. There is a legal constraint on us, courtesy of the state government, as to as to what we could do. I think there's for people who who think who just you know, raise taxes, but we can certainly raise property taxes. But you know, that that's a political decision that has to take place. Uh, but in terms of raising other revenue, those, those things are really constrained by by, by by state law. So then the task for this committee is to look at ways in, in which, where we can recover um, revenue. And I'm going to give you a, a good uh, example of this. And Margaret, feel free to shoot me down if I got it wrong. But um, looking at the four page, so the second to last, we're gonna, it's actually on the on both. Um, the fire, this is an emergency ambulance, um, Medicare and Medicaid pass-through monies, which are dated, the ordinances enabling those are dated 2007. And so that makes me think, well, I wonder if there, that isn't something that could be opened up and looked at to see if the, the, we're getting properly reimbursed um, from Medicare and Medicaid for eligible populations. Don't know. The date of the ordinance was coincides with the um, tenure of the former ten care director, <laughs> uh, David Manning. So I, I, I suspect that that he probably uh, engineered that. But but that might be. It's not emergency transportation costs, essentially. Right? It, yeah, it's uh, it's it's ambulance is how it shows up in the revenue manual for emergency. Um, what is Mars in this case? I don't know what Mars is. Does anybody? It's a it's a it's a fire reference, and it relates to emergency and ambulance transportation. In this case, Medicare does pay. You're gonna pay twenty percent. Yeah. That's all they're gonna. Yeah. The let's see if they. Uh, for people who are eligible for disabled. Right. And then Medicaid, and then they're supposed That's to write off the difference. Is the 2007? Did you look at the 2007? I didn't ordinance? look at the ordinance. No. So if it's if it's related to emergency. With ambulance transportation, I know. I think that was the year that the individual, the, the cost for each ride, went up from like three fifty to seven fifty. Okay. And I, so I don't know if that's, that's what, what this number would, is derived that's what from. The state would reimburse. That's the that's the cost for the ride, and so it either gets charged to the transportees' insurance, or if they're insured by, you know, Medicare, Medicaid, then. Right. Determining of whether I mean I don't know whether those pay for ambulance rides or not. Yeah, but so they do. It has, they whether it actually covers the cost or not. Is we also, don't. We yeah, don't and that's the that right. the point I'm making is that right. if you have if, if the ordinance was written in 2007, that that suggests to me that maybe that that needs a good a good look. And in 2007. One of the reasons that they increased the cost is because it wasn't covering the cost, so, and it hadn't been. And it, uh, you know, so it wasn't for a really long time. So if it was covering it in 07, it's a good chance it's not covering it 10 years, 11 possible. years later. I don't um, know. Yeah. So that. So those are the. Um, the that's the kind of cost recovery that I, I, the I don't, <coughs> revenue committee is going to meet after this, and we'll divide it up. But that, that's the way I think it, we can think about some of these things, um, and it. Without going straight to the often politically volatile question of of property taxes, there are there are other things that we 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 can we can look at. Um, I, I think, and um, and that's that, that's what the revenue committee is going to talk about um, next. And then, lastly, I just want to point out we've had a lot of conversations about the convention center authority. Um, and the money that they collect, we talked about a rather substantial surplus, which is about 104 million of liquid assets, and then they've got money that's reserved for uh, debt service and, and then they own some, some property, uh, which makes them really one of the richest entities in the city um, in terms of uh, cash uh, reserves that, that they that they have. So um, we collect, and I want to just spend a few minutes on the 
the, the taxes, they were all imposed over a number of years, um, initially to build the original convention center, which opened in 19, uh, 1986. And originally it was uh, th th three cents, and then we increased it to five plus one, I think is, is, is how it, how the, the history there. Um, but the, the one percent, one percent is for the convention center and is specifically directed to the, the convention center. Um, then there is two percent of the hotel occupancy taxes go to a misspelled promotion fund um, under contract with the CBB. So we collect two cents of the of a dollar of uh, two percent of each dollar, and that's directed to the Convention and Visitors Bureau for the purposes of promotion of the city. That is not encumbered by the convention center's debt. Okay. Um, then the uh, there is a one percent that is also for capital improvements to businesses um, and for tourist-related activities. Um, and then there's another special revenue fund, I presume, uh, goes to the, the convention center. And then the $2 occupancy tax, $2 per bed per head for hotels, that is also encumbered by the debt on the, um, on the convention center. So there's a, probably about three cents of the hotel occupancy taxes that are have a little bit more flexibility in their uses than the um, uh, than the uh, the the others. Um, now all of it right now is going into the convention center fund, um, and that is that's the reason for the the accumulation. In addition to this, the tourist development tax, which is the sales tax collected above a baseline that a baseline growth number the difference between that baseline growth number and what is collected that is also sent to the convention authority um, under the tourist development uh, and this was just circulated madam chairman um, the tdz collections from that tax to the music city center in uh, 18 was 44.7 million. So in that's 20, in, in 2018. In last fall, from, yeah. I believe. So from that's the in state. addition to these that's taxes. In addition to that, right. it's 44.7 million. And it's from the sales tax, John. That's from, from the, the sales tax. tax. Right, and it had, were there no TDZ, that revenue, that sales tax revenue would be accruing to the state of Tennessee and to the city of Nashville in the normal course of, of, of tax collection. But the entirety of the rate? Is going. That's what producing the forty-four oh, billion. It's not. Well, the, is, no, is that not right, Margaret? The entirety of the rate of the sales tax and the TDZ. Yeah. No, it's a. Um, there's a calculation yeah, for it. So it's a. It's an increase uh, over the countywide. Right. Yeah. So there's a. But there's a. So you have a, a rising baseline that ac that accommodates the growth of so, the city. So yeah, nine and a quarter percent yeah. produces. Uh, it would have produced $100 million. It's now producing $120 million. The $20 million, the rate is the same as applied, but but it is the $20 million that is then applied to the TDC. Well, and you you and you compare that with the increase overall in the county. Correct. So the, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that the you, however you calculate the base is normal, as normal base. Is it just growth or is it base? I think it's just growth. It's growth. Yeah. Okay. Minus base. But the, that that revenue, forty-four million dollars in eighteen, or some portion thereof, were it not for the TDZ, would would accrue to the metro right. government and to the split between state and, and the metro. state the state and metro. Yeah, um, but in this case, it's now being so the entirety of that growth above, uh, above the delta above the growth. Delta above the growth, the entirety goes to the TDZ, not not. You, the state does not retain any portion. Correct. Of that. Okay. Margaret, do I have that right? Correct. Yeah. No, no, that's fine. I'm just, we're just trying to understand. Yeah. So the state is that when does the base reset? Problem. Annually? No. Well. I don't know the answer to that question. I'm no, not sure. I don't. That's I don't. A deep question. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if there is a. Uh, that that's that's. And I want to dive into this deeper in the revenue committee because yeah, okay. we're going to have to dot really, you know understand what if we're going to make a recommendation about any revenue source that is not like cost recovery for planning or codes or 
or or Medicare, Medicaid, what have you. This is another area where you've got costs associated with the tourists, that you've got police, you've got fire, you've got, you know, um, uh, water, you got, you got a lot of Scooter stuff. Scooter injuries. Scooter injuries. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the cost, the cost would normally be recovered through mm -hmm. increased, the increased activity would generate increased sales and therefore you would have more revenue. But, um, but the cost recovery is not occurring similarly to these other examples that, that, that I'm giving. So, and I, I wanted to kind of lay that level set down so everybody understood that how, how, how restrained we are, first of all, in gathering, getting revenue. Um, and then second, there's still some pretty good solutions there when it comes to <clears throat> cost recovery and thinking of how do you make sure that the burden is borne in the right places. So I'd probably make the same argument for the C-bid, but it's not enough money to worry about. Any questions about that? Well, we can adjourn and then Revenue Committee, we're going to divide up our efforts to look at these revenue sources and make recommendations uh, on that front. Yeah, it's going to be an email form so you can mess with it a little bit better. I apologize. I've lost my clerical skills at my advanced age. Okay, so let's... Uh, Let's adjourn uh, the Blue Ribbon we adjourn. version. Motion to adjourn. Second. Okay. And uh, if you're on the Revenue Committee, stick around and we'll, we will uh, talk about uh, revenue shortly. Thanks so much. All right, let me call the Revenue Committee together the Blue Ribbon Commission, and we're going to talk about uh, some revenue sources and how we want to investigate those uh, further for... Uh, enhancing uh, the metro budget as we um, as we try to solve some of these issues and put the city in a path to less dramatic budgets is that a good way to describe it <laughs> so um, so I let you want to start with the con we can start at the convention center um, one of my questions about the money that flows into the TVZ and into the convention center is is a, is a lawful use of that fund of those funds tourist related activities in the in the tourism area so would it be a lawful use of funds to enhance police protection to enhance fire protection fire marshal inspections keeping uh, keeping the tourists safe, cleaning the streets, making sure it's a healthy, safe environment for people to be tourists in. And Margaret and I were talking before the meeting began, and uh, we we both don't know that quite answer that question. But I think John, it's one that we should dive into. I agree. I think there's some legal view that the state has been very broad in its construction of this, um, and. Can you dive into that just a little bit? Well, more? pretty much anecdotally, if a tourist might by chance wander near or buy it, uh, <laughs> okay, um, to some extent, so um, it would include the maintenance of green space that tourists might be part of. Um, historically, uh, arts, there's been arts funding. Um, Using that revenue. Historic um, commission funding. Okay. Uh, because tourists do visit mm -hmm. historic sources. Um, police overtime was certainly included in that. Um, so it's been, it's been pretty broadly construed, as well as facilities and sidewalks or roads that they may touch be, uh, tourists touch. as well. Right. Now, so I guess <clears throat> here's my one question. Do you have to consider this non-recurring revenue? Because I'm, I'm trying to understand how this base calculation is made and how and whether it is in fact something that's ongoing, uh, is, was the base set in X year, and therefore it, anything that comes in is that. Is it if the tourism were here were to fall off the edge of the um, of the table um, for whatever reason, would what would the revenue be? Uh, what's its fluctuation been? I, I just don't know the answer to those. So, but um, and then what is the pledging? Right, right. right. So it all goes back to the. Covenants in the bond, right. uh, I imagine. Now, 
is that well there's that but then there's what is the, what has it been about that what is well I just don't understand that and I think for that group all that becomes very important because I think the bonding of the MCC mm -hmm. some of this is build America bonds mm -hmm. that are actually very expensive taxable. and taxable but don't really have call provisions that you would think they would, and the Obama administration, you would know this better, I think actually subsidized those Build mm -hmm. America bonds. They do. Now there's not a subsidy, so you're on the hook for the higher tax rate, yeah. which would be way beyond what cities would normally and you pay. I don't think the entire subsidy went away, a portion of it went away due to sequestration. Is right, right. In, in the current environment. So, um, yes. All of this is a complexity, and then I don't think in these agreements is another thing to look for. There's anything that we would think of as a clawback necessarily, or a ceiling, or a sort of governor to ratchet back the rate of growth um, if you had a high sustained rate of growth over a period of time. So, Dave, I think the question for us here is if, because it is a large pool of money, and because we what I think we, given the vote on property taxes uh, last year, where we find ourselves is um, trying to bridge that gap until the proper process of assessment, reappraisal, increase, and ideally a four-year pay plan, which is how we used to do Another things. Another two years, right? Well, it's another two years, yeah. Um, but if getting to that point, even if it is a little tough, then puts you on a path that is more predictable, more sustainable, better for our employees, better for the government, lots of, you take a lot of the drama out of, and I'm not, I'm not prejudiced for one thing or another, sure. but I'm looking at that vote you know, on, on property taxes and knowing that that's not likely to turn out different in in a few months. Um, so, so that's the and maybe even it's worse in a few months because uh, uh, because we're we're headed into a, an Gotta election watch. cycle. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, so I want I, I think because it's so much money, I want to dive into the yeah, I mean, feasibility of its use. Because these others are. I mean, they're, they're dribs and drabs, and, and right. they're going to be con have controls on them that are going to make them less. Well, anyway, uh, yes, I agree. Okay, so I, I guess let me get a little help from all of y'all as to what are the qu and Margaret uh, and Stan chime in here. What are the things that we need to look at to see if it, so we can evaluate this properly? Obviously, the the debt encumbrances is the language of that which I talked with legal about um, then you want to know Dave more about the calculation and how right okay I mean because I mean I, I think about my old role and if I'm sitting up there and I'm thinking I'm losing revenue to Metro um, that I rightfully should be mine um, as at the state level mm -hmm. I'm going to be concerned over how that is calculated and sustained mm -hmm. over time because I might change my mind mm -hmm. about how it's calculated and sustained, or I do, have I looked at it? Yeah, I okay. don't know whether my credit, whether my successors and up there have looked at that. Yeah, and uh, whether the revenue commissioner looks at it. Uh, I just don't know enough yeah. about it to okay. know what that means. Okay. Well, if if you didn't mind, just um, the very words "revenue commissioner," because yeah. it's been frequently pointed out to me that Metro perhaps should have a specific revenue officer. Mm. And in terms of your experience with the state, I mean, I'm assuming that that has been useful. Um, so part of, again, well, part yours of is divided among constitutional officers and, and other you know, functionality that, that the state didn't have, so they had to consolidate it all within a centralized function, right, in that sense. Well, one of the comments that is made specifically on Metro is that legislation has a fiscal note which goes to the expenditures, but often does not, nothing is evaluated in kind of its revenue implications. Right. And then there's not really a revenue 
forecast rather than just the immediate fiscal year, but you have out year obligations. And so do you have a kind of a long-term revenue forecast? And then what are your long-term obligations? Again, these are private sector people making these suggestions to me um, that it would be something generally to discuss. And again, with the, your experience in the state, uh, that would you be... Know, the state hires or hires Tennessee of the UT Center for Business and Economic Research to do the, the, that forecasting. Um, and has, there, there, there's always a revenue uh, uh, session, if you will, of the state funding board, which pulls in three different economists from the different, you know, all the different universities get to get to participate in that, uh, public universities, um, and, um, and others. Um, but it, so there, are, there is that kind of functionality in that. Revenue projections, though, are said predictions are hard, especially about the future, right? Um, and, and so that, it, but the kind of centralized tracking is done by finance, I assume, on a, re, on a, on a backwards looking basis on all revenues. Um, yes, and, and you know, um, somewhat limited uh, forecasting. Right. Uh, you know, a lot of the, a lot of responsibility for that falls on the department through which the revenue is generated. Mm. You know, their, their analysts and so forth, whether it's... Does the Convention Center Authority have analysts doing projections on tax collection? You know, you know they, they have a, a financial person there, and... No, that's um, not what they do. I'm not, I'm not certain about okay. that. <clears throat> That's why I get concerned about you know, about it being treated as recurring revenue, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's a, because it is. I mean, we're going to have. I mean, just look at what we're going to have this year with this uh, with, with the NFL uh, draft, right? right? A massive hit, right? Positively, right? Uh, but you would be foolish to build, to build a pay raises right. into you know on that sort of uh, on yeah. that sort of. Well, well, you know, back, going back to the, you know, the political environment on, on the recurring revenue, which is a, the property tax, um, that would be, that, that's the kind of thing that would be scheduled in 2021, is that right? 2021? Um, Reappraisal is scheduled for 2021. That's okay. Right. So, yes, that's, that's the right way to put it. So, so maybe not to think of this as a reoccurring thing, but to think of this as a a way in which to keep the keep all the services in place that we want to keep in place and then get back to the four year cycles that we were on. I agree. I mean I see yeah, what you're saying, seeing a bridge um, and, and then that, and using it that's the way we used the the revenue reserves at the state was we we drew them down over the two year period there of starting with the recession in two thousand and eight. Right. Um, and, but then balanced spending to hit the recurring revenue as we were leaving, as we were going out the door. That, right. That's, 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 that's kind of what I'm thinking. Yeah, no, that, that's, a, yeah, no, right. I think that's right. But this happens to be one of the, um, all right, so we have to. So who, we need to get someone to explain to us the TDZ the functionality, how that works, how it's calculated. We need to understand, get someone else, assuming not the same person, to explain mm -hmm. to us the uh, uh, bond uh, obligations for all these funds. Uh, uh, Margaret's suggestion on the, 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 the burden with the, uh, would that be Bass Berry on the bond council? Uh, I mean, they would be able to explain that pretty well. The you know the bond yeah. covenants and those pledges, as far as the calculation and the methodology, that would be finance. They, that person that does right. that. So we can, if we could ask then finance to help us understand how the taxes are. Um, Projected, forecast, collected, anything we need to know there. And then, Margaret, if we could ask I'll reach out to Council. Jeff or somebody to come in and just the next meeting and ex give us a breakdown of what the encumbrances are, what money, you know, and, and what that, that $104 million, if, if the state's interpretation is acceptable to everybody, that 
it can go that some of that money can be used to address services downtown that frees up money for other things in the county um, so for that for the next meeting let's see if we can't accomplish that do you think that we'll get it done? contact someone with the state to find out how others are using it because we're not the only TDC out there right? yeah there's one in Gatlinburg right um, that's probably the origin of this. They, mm -hmm. they tended to be the, the quote, innovator, unquote. Premier tourist destination? Yes. <laughs> what what'd you say? I think they're, they're a premier tourist destination. No, they yeah. are a premier tourist destination. They've got 200,000 people coming next year. Um, so, the... Uh, well, it, so who can we... The same analysis is also probably true in the Convention and Visitors Bureau, which is... Mm -hmm. I was getting to that, yeah, but right. I want to stop yeah. at short-term rental before we go to the CVB, if we could. Um, yes. But uh, a, who would be ideal to state, Department of Revenue or the Comptroller's Office? Good question. Um, what are we wanting to know specifically? Well, I, th <laughs> I think we want to know how... The, is, as when it comes to the TDZ, yeah. um, in particular, how they are interpreting the use of those revenues, notwithstanding any encumbrances, we'll answer that question. Probably the comptroller. Then, if it's an audit, where they're going to come back and, and audit you of based upon is it part of their? Do they don't audit Metro though. They don't audit Metro, um, but they they do. They have done single mm -hmm. audits on us, I think. Yeah, maybe because it's a state source. That's yeah. that would be. Why don't I send my friend Justin Wilson a no. note, see what, how he can help us with a better understanding. Okay, so let me, uh, in the, along those lines, uh, this is small dollars, but I'm bringing it up because short-term rentals have become a big burden on the codes department as far as enforcement goes. And... The enforcement in the codes department for short-term rentals means there is an enforcement for other stuff. Um, so right now, short-term rental occupancy taxes, those are diverted to the convention center, correct? There, it's, it's the portion of the hotel occupancy tax that is assessed for short-term rentals that it rentals that is the 1% that would normally go into the general fund that we is did that diverted by to Barnes Fund. So okay. it's a really tiny, it's a, it's a really small. I mean, it's two and a half million dollars, yeah. It's yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty small. To the barge, well, fund, not to the convention center. Right, but the other correct. five sixths. Yeah. Everything go else to goes to the convention center. Because yeah. 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 it's already pledged to convention center. And yeah. that's because we use that mechanism to tax them and it's required for that to occur. Yeah. Right. It's it's part they of are that required to pay yeah. hotel yeah. occupancy tax because correct. they have transients in there for under 30 days. So as part of our analysis for the MCC pool of money, I think we probably want to look at is there any way to, to, to charge back the code's enforcement function um, to that, a cost of collection, if you will. I have to note that the parent, at least there's some people in the, in the public input section who believe that Board of Zoning Appeals is not adequately levying, the, they're giving a lot of forgiveness on appeals. To people. Well, I, I have to tell you, I was going through some of these, the, the collections on some of this stuff. It's nothing. <laughs> it's yeah. it's like 55, $100 for tattoo permit collections. $100. Like, we spent, we probably spent $1,000 collecting it. No, we, we probably spent $1,000 collecting it. I'm sure it's, there's a reason we have this, but I, but I, I yeah, I sort of feel the, the same way. So we'll include in that discussion about the, the convention center pool of money that because that is a that actually would be could be a legitimate that's a tourism expense. Yeah. Right? I mean it, if any I mean it, it would, I would think the T D Z money could be used to help support inspection. Okay, and then lastly in um you know, is is the is the the C V B that contract was renewed, I want to say, in the 2011. Do you know? It's it, that's I don't. So it, it's still a contract. John, do you know when it was last renewed? I don't. Uh, Is that going to be annually approved by the council? No. No, it's a it's a f probably five years. Very year. much not. Five years is, I, I think, correct. So then that would have expired. 
it would have expired and then it must have been renewed. Mm -hmm. Maybe and, a couple of years ago. Yeah, must have been. And the CB, the CVB, but the background is they would, they were, uh, the the contract, and they were a nonprofit then. They're now mm -hmm. a for profit. They're really the CVC, mm -hmm. right? Not the right. CVB. Um, I didn't so know that there's an actual change from nonprofit to for profit. They That's went. Why they changed that? Yeah, and they went and they changed it from the CV, the nonprofit to for profit somewhere around 2011 12 about the time that they re-upped I think on that that contract but but the back story is is that the two cents of the hotel occupancy tax was was for promotion and um, and ten years ago it was about each penny was worth about five five and a quarter million now each penny is worth about ten ten to uh, roughly, so so the amount of money that's being diverted mm -hmm. um, to the CVB is really a substantial sum of money, and the question is, I think John, the question is, are there no economies of scale so that as as t tourism, uh, <laughs> obviously they're doing a good job, tourism has increased, but but as um, as, as they they grow and they are tasked with doing more and more. Are there no economies of scale that mean the two cents doesn't increase exponentially, but rather mm -hmm. um, that we can uh, acquire some? Is that a locally controlled decision? Uh, it is the state. The state law says for tourism promotion and tourism related activities. Is that the other? Is it that? Yeah, and we choose to spend it on on. The, the CVB, but the contract, the state law, uh, unless it's changed recently, doesn't specifically say go out and get a contract with a sure. with a bureau. Right. So you could do it in. So some cities choose to do it through their local government. I think some cities have, like Gatlinburg, what? Chambers, Chambers, yeah. or yeah, yeah, it's another another option. So thoughts on that? There's a, I think we have to look at what the contract says. Yeah. Contract and control over the revenue. Yeah. Well, and as you say, are there economies of scale that might free up some money for general fund reimbursement that is going to tourist-related activities? Mm -hmm. Okay. A fair question. So we need the contract. Who's got it? The Metro Clerk should have it. The what? Metro Clerk should have okay. the contract. Have you looked at the contract? No. No. Okay. I'll ask the clerk for a copy of that. Um, and the most recent, so we'll know when it expires, mm -hmm. and we'll know what timing could be with respect to maybe asking them to make a contribution or acknowledge certain, you know, uh, the decreasing marginal costs associated with the work each convention they get as a result of their... You know, I assume they, they like for things, again, I think back to this this huge event, the set of events we have coming up on that one weekend where they've you know, got the race and yeah. the NFL. Um, there's a lot of cost involved with that. And separating those two events and making all that come together, I'm assuming this is the fund that they use for that or the other... Uh, Special fund, special revenue fund for program-related activities. That, that that's, that's the promotion that like that pays for the Music City Bowl is right. one of the big uses of that. Um, the the CD we don't we don't actually the truth is we don't really know what they're spending the money on. The, I, I don't think they've been audited now that they're a um, now that they're for profit. You used to be able to look at their 990s on uh, when they're nonprofit. They're for profit now, so. Um, is there has there been an audit or any kind of inquiry into how they're spending it recently? They don't and, have an I'm audit not. I'm not. As part of the contract, I don't know of one. Well, I think there is a viewed as a little bit of an audit law because you've contracted with a private party for these services, mm -hmm. and that normal metro audit function stops at that wall. And that, you'd that have to specify in the contract what you want. You would have to specify in the contract. So what's right. This, this and that would, that would make sense, but I'm surprised that there wouldn't be some 
bought it before in the contract. Right, and there there possibly is, but, but the people cite this wall audit. often, yeah. um, and that it's not a, it's not a government agency by any means. Right. Um, the majority of the money does come from tax. I'm just I, I mean my equivalent is thinking through some of the, the grant even small grants that Metro makes to private nonprofits and they go through an audit, audit. Mm -hmm. process yeah. that confirms that it, we that is specifically laid out in their contracts. Right. That's right. 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 That's what so the question is what's in the contract. Right. So I'll I'll find I'll find that out. I'll get the contract, find that out and see what the pathways are so that we could make a recommendation um, for considering, you know, the considering whatever, right. making sure the costs line up with the revenue in a fair and appropriate way. It's probably the best way to think of it. And understand the variability of their costs. And understand mm -hmm. that, absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah. And the and the competitiveness of their business. Right, right, I mean, right. it's crazy competitive. Right. Yeah. yeah. But uh, and we may it may not be something that we want to pursue, but it's definitely worth knowing more about. Well, and I do think that the revenue projections are very meaningful in this discussion because 3,000 hotel rooms can really mean $20 million worth of tax revenue mm -hmm. between the hotel tax. And so you do have possibly built-in increases so that it's not really going to force any cuts in what's existing now. It's, it's future revenue right. possibly mm -hmm. going to defray a general fund expense. Okay. So it's a percentage of the rev of the hotel revenue. Well, also countywide. Yeah, county countywide and it's but I guess yeah, I don't know. There's all the speculation that we're approaching whatever that magic point is where we'll be overbuilt, right? And, we, uh, and um, you know, and where wherever I don't you know say that's recurring true. revenue <laughs> concern. Are, you mean in terms of hotels? Yes, hotels. Yeah, rooms. I was talking to our 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 uh, gaming leisure and lodging analyst uh, yesterday, he says, "Yeah, everybody keeps predicting Nashville is overbuilt, and it's just not happening." Yeah, that's what that's what I mean. Everybody yeah. says it, everybody believes, you know, worries about it, but it does. I, I, I haven't seen anything from anyone who's credible about about. I, I, and, and what are the what are, the is it just one of those things it. like any other economic yeah. data that you you don't know you're dead until you're dead, <laughs> um, or you're going to die until you're dead, you know, kind of thing where the just yeah. goes off the edge on you. But between the two and a quarter percent that is metro tax, and then five cents out of the six cents in hotel tax, that's seven and a quarter percent of every hotel bill. So yeah. uh, coming back mm -hmm. to the tourist space, mm -hmm. which is quite a lot. Now the state does super well on this, getting mm -hmm. five cents mm -hmm. on every hotel bill, yep. and probably has and does have fewer expenses um, on this. Sure. Okay, well, I'll, I'll volunteer to get the contract. Um, we've got... We probably don't know this, but as it relates to the CVC, do we know whether this represents all of their revenue? No. What portion of their revenue? We do know that they get membership revenue. So they... Uh, okay. Um, it, in, this is going back a number of years, but it's always... It, Back when I was in council, or around the time the convention center was being built, it was in that million dollar range. Um, mm -hmm. it, it may be more uh, more today. The, I, I would I think it's fair to represent that the majority. The, the, the majority is coming from the taxpayers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe even a super majority. Mm -hmm. but can ask about find out what the inquiry could be. Okay, are there any other revenue? before we adjourn. Any other revenue sources? Oh, well, oh let me add, um, Brad. Um, the hospital authority, I'm going to ask Mark to come in. There are two things that they are looking at for external revenue, uh, meaning revenue that isn't coming from the operations, but from other sources. Um, and uh, like the convention center, it's got lots of external mm -hmm. revenue. Um, and that is the 340-day drug discount program. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the CEO is going to go talk to Vanderbilt about that their program. Um, and if anyone's not familiar with that, that's essentially you buy drugs at a greatly reduced price, and then you're able to build Medicare at list price, and you keep the difference for the purposes of indigent like care. 
Yeah, I bet you don't. It's a real program. <laughs> Hotly debated in Congress right now, but it is still a real program. And the other is taking a look at the Medicaid dish um, possibilities and making sure that those are, those are maximized. So, um, so I'm going to, with Dave, we're probably going to go sit down um, with Ten Care and, and also the hospital authority uh, leadership is, is looking at that. And the goal is more revenue. You know, they because of what they do, they have it, the poss they, these possibilities exist. You know, where otherwise would be the case. So, so I, I just want everybody to know I'm working on that. Are there any other revenue sources that people would like to discuss? Or I have a question about the like temporary street closing mm -hmm. and that number being a relatively low yeah. looking number mm -hmm. and whether or not back to our question about ambulance cost cost recovery what is the cost does the cost outweigh that revenue so, so what is that driving a like? street party or is that more like the, what are the no bill, like bill when they cl close down i assume yeah that's right Parking, you know, a portion of a street to do construction, oh, okay. or it might be for a special event. I would think, but well, and it isn't just the cost associated with with the uh, you know the, well, the then repair the street after yeah. they're done. <laughs> well, that's up to big, the contractor, okay, okay. but the but the, the, the you know the the, the police then have yep. frequently yep. have to get involved. Yep. There's a lot. Yeah, that's what I'm wondering. Yeah, are we are we really to understanding the expense of that versus what we're what the revenue source and charging. Yeah. Who has public I, works? Patrick, are you a public works? Yeah. I think they, they, we did have some conversation about that, and I think finance may be actually looking at that issue, but I'll follow up with, with them if you'd like. Yeah, because that, do, that do, did to me look like a crazy low number. Um, and, uh, and and quite honestly, some of the building permit numbers looked really low. I had low. the same, same thought. Yeah. Um, and, and I really want to know, the alarm device permit was moved over to codes to make it a more efficient mm -hmm. um, gathering, efficient process. Uh, that's, a, that's a super tiny number. I know we need to know what alarm, um, alarms are for the fire department. But right. It's not a great, I don't, well, I don't know. And I don't know, is it the, I assume it's not the same cost for residential versus commercial. It's different, yeah. um, but the cost is, has not changed in... Um, okay, At so least? twenty years for fifteen years, <laughs> twenty years for residential, fifty for yeah. commercial. Oh wow! Um, so nothing really. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not advocating for raising people no, no, fees, I, but yeah. but it, it, if we're not cover, cover, co mm -hmm. covering the cost of collecting, then that's something we need to look at. Twenty seems really low to me. And a lot of these things, you, they're low because they haven't been touched in right quite a number of years. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we have on our to-do list uh, the hotel occupancy fund, the CVB contract, um, the hospital authority. Brad, I'll keep you in the loop on that. Um, and uh, you're also going to look at cost recovery uh, questions of, with uh, public works. Right. And now TJ's got codes, so I'll check. It, I'll check with him to see if he could. Um, inquire as to when the la those were last looked at that I am doing that in planning to make sure they're recovering costs on their um, on their plan reviews and so forth. Do you have anything else? Okay. All right. Motion to adjourn. So move to motion. Right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thanks. Okay. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.